Dear friends, I would like to show you in this chapter how, by modifying a little bit the classical indentation technique, we can make it play all the different roles we saw in chapter 5. You will see that it can change the result and even slightly change the strategy to adopt compared to the classic technique using an elastic indentation material, whether it is a liquid sponge or a rail held in place by an encircling band. In both cases, the indentation effect is linked to the centripetal pressure exerted by the elasticity of the system, which, apart from the complications generated, will prevent any intraoperative assessment of the intensity of the indentation and any scleral shortening effect which could modify the ind indications. You will thus understand why the indications for indentation may need to be further increased compared to the recommendations of the IVRS RD study and improve the overall results. Since the technique for making an indentation is no longer taught much to beginners, I will tell you everything, as if you knew nothing about indentation. I made a movie in 1998, I saw it again, and having nothing to change, I decided to present you the part dedicated to the indentation technique. It's a truism to indicate that the right place for a buckle is where the indentation has to be. Before indenting a tear, one must precisely localize it to indent at the exact site. The assistant will pull the muscles. The tear will be localized with the surgical microscope at a high magnification through the three mirror lens. The scleral projection will serve as a landmark to place the buckle. The distance to the limbus is anecdotal. This varies according to different factors. Individual, myopia, quadrants. On the contrary, the aura serrata projection is always on the muscle's insertion line, except for the superior rectus, where the aura is one millimeter in front of the muscle insertion. The reference will always be the four rectus muscles. To simultaneously indent a tear and the vitreous base, the tear itself must be localized. The anterior limit of the vitreous base is one millimeter in front of the aura serrata, anterior to the muscle insertion. The posterior limit is three to five millimeters posterior to the insertion. Since it is technically difficult to indent in front of the muscles, the buckle will be placed as close as possible to the insertion line. The choice of limbus parallel or radial indentation is a matter of different parameters. If the buckle has to be wider than 50 degrees, more than half a quadrant, a radial indentation is not possible. 
If the anterior-posterior tear's length is superior to 8 mm, a limbus parallel indentation is not possible. If the tear is posterior, equatorial or retroequatorial, a limbus parallel buckle is technically difficult. It will not indent the vitreous base. If the vitreous base has to be relaxed, or if a fold indentation is indicated, a limbus parallel buckle at the muscle insertion will be more efficient. If the posterior limit of different tears is not at the same level, cross indentations will create retinal folds. The suture's tractions will be conflicting. A higher buckle is indicated that will indent homogeneously all the pathological area. As a rule, the smaller possible buckle will be preferred. It spares room and diminishes surgical trauma. Encircling procedures can create macular edema due to vortex veins compression. They should be avoided as much as possible. But localized indentation may have to be enlarged in the following conditions. If two retinal tears are separated by less than 50 degrees, one larger buckle will be preferred to two smaller ones. A small circumferential retinal fold will be widely covered to sufficiently relax the vitreous base. A retraction zone distant from a tear may be protruded by one fold indentation. A 360-degree encircling band will only be placed if a continuous series of tears cannot be treated by a combination of indentation plus gas injection, or in case of massive vitreous retraction, or PVR superior or equal to grade C2. Encircling plus strap seem to be inappropriate. A large 360 degree conjunctival disinsertion may cause secondary troubles. The strap has to be sutured tight and the elasticity based action can be very toxic. This will be recalled later on. Indentation must be confined to the pathological area. Only the internal part of round implants indents the retina. External side bulges under the conjunctiva and hinders the muscles. Scleral surface must be deformed by indentation. Concave internal surface implants are inefficient. Implant's internal surface must be convex. Round section implants will deform the sclera, but the area of contact is too small. Therefore, any anterior or posterior error in the positioning of the buckle will create gaping tear's edges. Neither does a round indentation protect the tear from detachment waves. Breakwaters facing the sea have sharp edges. Their surface is plain or slightly convex. Therefore, a good implant will be a sharp edged and a slightly convex internal face will securely position the retinal dehiscence.
Many complications are rather related to the implant's material than to its design. Elastic or compressible sponges and straps should no longer be used. When such an implant is stretched or compressed, the relaxing effect will create a centripetal force opposite to the centrifugal action of ocular tension. Two negative consequences will damage the eye. Indentation will be proportional to ocular tension. Sclera and choroid will suffer from these opposite forces. Scleromalacy derives from this. This enucleated eye demonstrates the transscleral and transchoroidal materials migration. Here, the sclera has melted under a mirror gel implant. Even a small diameter elastic material may cut through the underlying tissues. This 2 mm strap and the suture have penetrated the retina. String syndromes related to elastic or tight encircling techniques have the same origin. An indentation material must be non-elastic and incompressible. Only the sutures will then create the scleral deformation. Implant itself will mold the indentation with no centripetal force. The higher post-operative silicon sponges infection risk is widely accepted. Antibiotics implant soaking has little, if any, influence. Infection is the major cause of indentation material exclusion or ablation, with an average 4% incidence for sponges. This is a serious complication since detachment recurrence rate after implant removal varies from 3 to 34 percent. All these findings led us to sharp edges 2 to 2.5 mm thick. Internal and external walls are slightly convex. The height varies from 5 to 7.5 mm. For localized treatments, we have been using, for the last five years, expanded PTFE implants manufactured by FCI. The chevron networking of PTFE has the same structure as scleral collagen. The 35 micron meshes are small enough not to allow any compression or elasticity. Fold indentations are possible with this material. A major interest derives from biocolonization by fibroblasts and macrophages. These cells produce collagen type 1, 2, 5, 6, responsible for a remarkable tolerance and for persistent mechanical properties. This implant has been placed a month ago. Scleral fibrils have already developed. Underlying sclera is absolutely normal. 
scanning electron microscopy demonstrates the persistence of chevron networking and the development of fibroblasts inside the meshes. Anti-collagen antibody staining colors in brown the edges colonization. Absence of inflammatory foreign body reaction and biocolonization speak for the perfect tolerance. The rejection is close to impossible, but for two cases out of 1,200. The adhesion can be a problem if the implant has to be moved elsewhere. This one has been placed a year before. Underlying sclera seems untouched. Anticollagen antibody staining illustrates a total implant colonization. This is why we prefer a different material, with the same design, for encircling and fold encircling procedures. Hard silicon is biologically inert and there will be no cellular ingrowth. This can be a problem for localized buckles whose ends may be bulging under the conjunctiva. But the end-to-end -end suture of the encircling band will not face this situation. Reoperations are more frequent when an encircling procedure is needed. A different band positioning will be easier if the material is not adherent. The rectus muscles in the treatment area are held by bridal sutures. The eyeball is held and rotated by the assistant who also reclines the episcleral tissue. The assistant must be taught immobility and careful maneuvers with vortex veins. The height of the buckle has to be adapted to the tears. In a limbus parallel indentation, a safety margin, 1 mm anterior and 2 mm posterior, has to be established. Since most tears are less than 2 mm long, a 5 or 5.5 mm high buckle will be indicated. In the case of a radial treatment, 1.5 mm overlap on both sides of the tear must be left. If two tears are at a different distance from the aura, a higher buckle will be to be preferred to an oblique positioning. If the vitreous base has to be relaxed, the posterior margin of the tear will still have to be safely covered and the anterior limit of the indentation will be located at the anterior limit of the rectus muscles. The needle holder must have short, strong and round flanges. The edges must be blunt so as not to cut the sutures. The needle must be very firmly held. It has to be directed at an acute or obtuse angle. The needle model is a key point. A round one with a triangular tip, RV2 type, is our choice. Here, 
we demonstrate the need for a curved needle holder and a round needle. Anterior posterior sutures are guided through the sclera at an obtuse angle. It is not easy to penetrate the sclera. Therefore, it can be directed in a more controlled fashion due to the intrascleral resistance. Posterior anterior sutures needle is at an acute angle and tilted to the side. If the edges were sharp, the risk of dilacerating the sclera or the choroidal vessels would be high. A round needle passes through the tissues without cutting them. The thread has to be large enough not to cut through. It has to be resistant and non-elastic. Our choice is 5-0 Mersuture. Before suture placement, one must calculate the size of the implant's bed. A space equivalent to the implant's thickness is measured on both sides in order to sink the buckle into the sclera. A 5 mm high and 2 mm thick implant will necessitate a 9 mm bed. By removing a correct indentation, one can check the double thickness plus height necessary distance. Sutures are passed perpendicular and not parallel to the implant. Many reasons can be found. If the sutures are parallel, the knot will be tied over the implant to avoid loosening. This will create a rigid system at the final tightening. The traction forces will be perpendicular to the intrascleral thread. These are tearing forces and tearing might happen. If the sutures are perpendicular to the implant, the knot will be tied over the sclera. A triple loop will block it and this will facilitate the final adjustment. Forces will be tangential or parallel to the intrascleral tunnel. These will be folding forces, not tearing ones. The first example is that of a localized limbus parallel indentation. Anterior suture is at the anterior margin of the implant's bed. It must have a short bite. Posterior passage must be radial in the same axis. This will be made easier by depressing the sclera and reversing its shape with the surgeon's other hand. This displays the surgical area and the suture is longer. The distance between the two posterior bites will have to be larger than between two anterior bites to keep the sutures in a radial axis. Even a short buckle necessitates two U sutures on both sides of the tear. This will strengthen the buckle. 
If an over 90 degrees treatment is necessary, a third double suture has to be placed. Positioning. Suture lengths and axis must be homogeneous in order to achieve a satisfactory and consistent result. This must be done carefully and slowly. The hammock is ready for implantation. A triple knot will be prepared on every U suture. This will be facilitated by placing the needle holder open flanges against the sclera. This triple knot will not loosen. Fundus control is possible without tying the knots. An additional traction on the sutures is possible if needed. No parallel sutures, no compressible material will ever be used for fold encircling procedures. If the implant is deformed, there will be no fold and the longitudinal axis of the globe will increase in size. With incompressible material and perpendicular sutures, there will be a scleral fold and the axis will be shortened. This posterior fold is achieved through longer interscleral sutures. Since the traction forces increase the fold, this has to be created at the posterior part of the eye in a detached retina area. Therefore, the posterior suture has to be 2 or 3 mm long. Vortex veins must be protected. Subretinal fluid release will be done in the intervortical avascular zone to create more available space.
progressive tightening of the knots will create indentation plus fold. Radial indentation has similar principles. Sutures are parallel to the limbus. Intrascleral tunnels are short. All sutures axes are parallel. The inferior edge of an inferotemporal disinsertion is nearly always at the same place in the inferior rectus insertion. It is difficult to indent so anteriorly. The temporal end of the muscle insertion can be removed to allow a 1 or 2 mm additional space for a correct buckle placement. Superfluous material must be removed even if PTFE colonization will prevent rejection. Indentation is sufficient. The knots can be tightened. Encircling bands and fold encirclings necessitate two sutures per quadrant, eight U sutures. End-to-end -end closure without traction. An X knot will improve apposition.
It will not create over thick buckling and the implant can be rotated. No centripetal traction must be present before tightening the last knot. I hope that this film has taught you some things. We will meet again in the next chapter for the realization of the puncture and gas injection.